Good morning everybody, it's fantastic, really fantastic to be in my hometown talking about patient and public involvement. I cannot emphasise how important that means to me. Um, my introduction to PPI was less controversial than Carol's, I think, um, <laughs> but none, nonetheless it came from working with patients uh, and certainly being inspired by patients and somebody in particular, Michael Griffith, who who actually founded IPOSI and continues to inspire me in my work in, in IPOSI. I'm just going to give you a quick video of some somebody who also has inspired me. And very much the presentation today is about patients. It's not about me. It's about people like Joan. It's about people like, like Carol and people like Mags, who you're going to see. Um, this was an event we, we ran. Um, we were involved in, 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 a, uh, in a cost action, which is a, a networking action around Europe. And we brought uh, a whole load of students from all around Europe together with uh, IPOSI patient members. And one in particular, uh, Mags from uh, Move for Parkinson's, uh, agreed to do an interview with, with, with us afterwards. And I'm just going to just play a little video of that. I see connected health as a transformative area of research, particularly in the area of healthcare delivery. If you look at the way it, which uh, technology is changing our lives in other areas, such as banking or um, logistics. I do have more than one suit, by the way. Technology is what actually brought us to where we are It's already brought us there, which is absolutely not. So I never kind of connected. We're asking us to um, talk about our typical day. And we were saying, there's no such thing. Um, and then they were asking us about the, how to manage it. Like, you have to be really well planned. And if you get really well planned, then you'll be fine. But it doesn't work like that as well. There's still that unpredictability. So I think they found it, I think they probably found it um, quite difficult to understand because they haven't seen me in one of my off periods where I don't move at all. They only want to be on, that means on medication that they guarantee them to they go through the day smoothly. So the thing that I find surprising is uh, the amount of medication they take on a daily basis because it, it becomes a real issue. Interaction with the end users in any way is uh, crucial. You have to really go deeper and touch the emotion of the user also uh, to, to find out what are their insecurities about the daily tasks they have to take. What are their uh, uh, assumptions? What are their hopes? These are the insights you will get only from when you interview them, when you talk with them, and you relate with them in that way. Even the actual connection with people who are doing the IT work, even that, that, that joining together, that, that, that collabor collaboration, can bring up things that you least expect. I think my life has been hugely enriched, um, not from having Parkinson's, but having the experience that I've had and um, with the charity over the last two years and the last eight years of my life. Um, I've done some amazing things. I've, I've been, been allowed and privileged to do some amazing things. But yet there's that loss of, you know, what would it have been like if I hadn't had Parkinson's and, uh, um, and that's, that's, that's difficult as well, you know. Um, I was a reasonably good golfer and I don't play golf anymore. Um, or facing brain surgery in the next year, and um, they're the kind of daunting piece of it. So I think that's really important, is that we stay connected, that's really important. Um, we absolutely have got to get things going now, um, because technology is an absolute way forward, absolute way forward. Well, I think in that video, I, le I learned a lot about how patients and, and researchers can, can interact uh, and the learnings that can be achieved uh, on both sides. Um, certainly from the way that that uh, format was used, it was very much an informal setting. 
Um, we've, we've done a number of activities where we've, we've done quite formalized settings and informal, and we find that it does depend on the context and the subject that, that you're working with. Uh, but certainly, uh, from our patient members, they certainly get so much back from, from engaging with, with researchers and learning more about them. And uh, that's certainly an ethos of what IPOSI is about. It's about empowering patients through education and training uh, around the research environment because we find that the better educated patients are able to make uh, more significant uh, contributions. So IPOSI operates uh, as an umbrella group over uh, a number of patient organizations. We have over 100 patient organizations. Um, and no more than and Sarah in, in Jigsaw was saying, it's really important that we're not representative of all patients. Uh, we are advocates, and we advocate uh, for patients and, and for patients, patients to lead. Um, but nobody speaks for all patients. It's, it's very important to say that. Um, we operate as a platform between patient science and industry, and we're a very unique organization in that regard. Our, our, our website contains all the information you need. It's iposi.ie. Uh, and we focus on uh, very much non-disease specific areas, so areas that are common to, to as, uh, as many patients as possible, really. And we focus very much on providing patient access, uh, and that's about speeding up access to, to treatments and technologies, but also, uh, at the same time, empowering patients to become more engaged, more informed, and more involved. So, as I said, we have over 100 patient organizations as members uh, from all over Ireland. Um, our scientific members are from uh, a lot of the academic institutes, but also from a lot of the uh, uh, scientific societies and indeed state agencies. Um, our industry members are predominantly from pharmaceutical and from uh, clinical research organizations. And the way in which we were funded is that we, we uh, have a, a, a central grant from the <laughs> Department of Health that's uh, that's administered through the, the Health Research Board and we report to the Health Research Board uh, and we're, that, that keeps us going and we charge our industry members uh, a fee and that funds uh, a, a lot of our activities. So uh, our activities are multiple. We, we run different types, as I said, in different formats. It's about patients leading uh, and uh, certainly our, our emphasis is very much on producing information that's relevant to patients and that's, that's centered uh, with them uh, in mind across a number of, of, of areas. And I won't go into them today, but one of the fundamental ethos of, of IPOSI is that we feel that, that patients have a key role in all aspects of health-related research. Now, that can, for the purposes of this slide, this focuses very much on, on medicines development, but could be applied to other areas as well. So you've uh, the public element in terms of the public facing and public attitudes towards research. You have membership uh, and patient involvement in things like uh, the competent authorities, such as the, the European Medicines Agency, research ethics committees, uh, health technology agencies, and, uh, and importantly, in the whole area of clinical research. And the, the specific topics that, that we've uh, found that uh, the, the key role of patients is in the design of research, in terms of uh, informed consent and ethical review, the value assessments that are done uh, when new technologies are, are coming through, and indeed the whole area of, of health policy. And the major question for us is whether there are actually enough patient advocates there to engage in the, the entire process of health-related research. It's certainly a question that in a small country like Ireland, we do have to work towards generating what we feel is, is a, a more informed cohort of patients to be able to, to effectively uh, engage and involve themselves. Because it's obvious over the past number of years that the unique insights of patients and patient organizations have that into the, the real life of, of patients and, and how, uh, what patients' real needs are so that can be addressed through, through research. It's vital to incorporate that. And there are certain time points along the, I guess, the spectrum of research where patients can actually make a significant impact. So uh, this slide is it's kind of blurred here, but uh, 
those kind of time points are, are highlighted there in terms of study design, informed consent, uh, information and communication. But what's obvious to us is that there's different levels of expertise that would be required at those different time points. So it's, it's quite a complicated process for, to be able to identify, well, not only what people are most, or patients are most interested in, but where they would be uh, most effective. So we've been educating our patient communities for a number of years, and we run training days that are very much along the lines of, of providing uh, patient-centered and, and patient-tailored information about quite complex topics. But we've, more recently, we've been involved in a European initiative that focuses on patient education in medicines R&D. And I'm happy to be joined up uh, today by uh, one of the trainees, the Irish trainees, Joan Jordan, who you'll, be, who you'll meet in a minute. But I'm just going to give you a little background on, on UPATI itself, because we feel we can learn an awful lot from our, our particular experience in this project. Um, and UPATI develops patient education targets towards a, a number of different audiences. Uh, it provides a training course for, there was over 100 patient experts going through this course, and they're still going through it. Uh, and coming out at the end of it, they'll have completed a, a UPATI certified uh, training course on medicines uh, development and research. There's also a, a freely available uh, educational toolbox, which has taken some of the content of the course and made it far more user friendly, far more uh, publicly accessible, um, and that's available through the UPATI website. And there's also, a, a I think, pretty much the, va the, the strongest <coughs> internet library for patient involvement in medicines research in this area, and it's also translated. So it's a huge resource, it's a massive initiative. Uh, its objectives were to provide the kind of credible, correct, objective public information about medicines research and development because to date a lot of information had been produced but a lot of it was not credible because it was being provided by either an individual company or for specific purpose or in a specific condition. Um, but also to build the capacities and the competencies of, of patients and the public so that they would become not just more informed but have the potential to become more involved and to collaborate uh, with researchers, uh, be it public or, or private. The areas covered were uh, six prim primary areas, and these, these are the areas, but what I would emphasize is that all the way through the course and through the material, it's very much emphasi emphasized as to what the roles of the different stakeholders are, plus the role of the, and responsibilities of the patient who becomes involved in these processes. So it's it's ultimately transferable to other areas of research. The toolbox went live in February of this year, and we would certainly encourage people to, to log on to the toolbox. It's at upati.eu. Um, it contains a whole load of different types of material that's, uh, again, freely available for people to take and adjust to, to their own communities. Um, there's also a, a number of educational platforms that IPOSI is leading the coordination of. And these are, have started up in 12 different countries where they're taking the material and making it more user-friendly but also tailored to the national contexts. So not only from a translation point of view but also for what's relevant for patients in, in that country. And a number of countries have actually signed up as well. So where we, when we started off with 12, we're actually up to 17 countries now. And IPOSI is the national platform in this regard. We have nine Irish trainees as part of that platform, and we would certainly like to grow that number. Uh, they're from a number of different uh, disease uh, areas and, and also from a number of different patient organizations, so there's a good spread. And we've got an area of our website where we're actually highlighting their own experience and their own expertise, not only from being involved in the course, but from what their personal interests and, wh and where their interests lie. And we, we're, um, we're going around the country for a number of events to highlight this. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Joan. Joan is a proud, <laughs> loud woman and has been, is still going through the UPATI course uh, and has been at the first face-to-face. -face. So uh, Joan, if you'd like to come up and just tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Derek. Thank you very much. Um, well, something that Mags mentioned in the video there, 
she says she's being allowed to do things and me getting involved in the Upashi project I feel like I'm now being allowed to do things the things that that I want to do so it's it's a really important thing so I'll just tell you a little bit about myself first of all I'll start at the top I'm a patient I've got multiple sclerosis as well so um, I was diagnosed about six years ago and what I would say now about my MS is I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired I've just had it for so long now it's got to become a new normal so um, I'm also a carer for my son my son Aidan is nine now when he was three he developed a very rare form of epilepsy he was having maybe 30 seizures a day and he had to wear a helmet to protect his face so um, we tried lots of different types of treatments and um, we never actually controlled it but then about a year ago when he was eight he just grew out of it all of a sudden so he just needs to get back on, on track now so that that's that's just keeping him in mainstream school is a bit of a, a challenge um, I am a computer science graduate so I have I'm actually one of those people who really like statistics <laughs> so that's come in really useful my background that I actually like maths it's I like the, the fact that it's either wrong or right so um, after I graduated um, from college I worked all over the world so I got a chance to live in the States I lived in Holland for a while I lived in France and how that is relevant is that I got to see the medical system in those different countries so when I was in America I got my wisdom teeth taken out and that was fine until I got the bill and I nearly needed to go back to hospital but then I also lived in Holland I had my first child in Holland 11 years ago so I've got experience of, of the system over there so that that helps me that I have seen a medical system in different countries um, I worked for about 15 years in IT mobile phones was what the industry that I was working in so I'm used to working in a team and um, you know managing deadlines and projects and one thing that I, I know from that is that you need to be involved right at the requirements stage because if you don't get your requirements right then you're going to make the wrong thing so I, I can see that translating into when I when I'm looking at at what what patients actually want that it's very important that their needs are considered right at the requirement stage uh, a global traveler like I said I've lived all around the world but now because of my multiple cirrhosis I've moved back to the village that I was born in so I'm back my kids are going to the school that I went to and um, it's it's slightly frustrating in a way but that's just the way it is and I feel that I need to be close to my family for support um, now next thing when I got uh, diagnosed six years ago I did take part in a clinical trial for two and a half years so I've been in a clinical trial a double blind randomized placebo controlled <laughs> trial um, and that experience I feel at the time I was just newly diagnosed and, and actually being a participant in a trial for so long now helps me in my UPASHI training because I have actually walked the walk. Um, now a patient advocate, I kind of started similar to Carol in that um, I got involved very small at the start. There was an ad in MS Ireland's magazine asking for bloggers. so. I answered the ad and I've got, just gotten involved in things basically. I went along to an IPOSI meeting and um, just checked things out and if there are things that I like then I, I stay with them. So uh, things are kind of snowballing at the moment. I was in Barcelona last week for a week with my Apache training so things are getting a bit out of control and my husband's starting to say, <laughs> when are you going to be home again? But um, that it's it's... It's kind of a whole new world for me. Things have really changed I never imagined. Is that a minute? Yeah. Okay. Um, so now onto the Upati. This is, um, I really encourage you all to look at the Upati toolbox, www.upati.eu. It's, um, as Derek explained, we're learning all about medicines research and design. The areas that really appeal to me would be the statistics side because of my love of maths. But you can delve into any area that you're interested in and it's all under Creative Commons license so you can bring it back to your own organisation share it 
it's a trusted source as well, so you can trust the information that's on there, which I think is very important when you're when you're finding information on the on the internet. So www.upati.eu, and um, I'm also a blogger, like Carol. Um, I'm a group blogger. There's eight of us. I've done one. Oh well. <laughs> First one is the hardest, isn't it? And you can do a group blog with us if you want with MS Ireland. Um, so, so that's that's me. Um, I think that today it's been so amazing to hear so many patients speaking. Like um, Olive really got her points across. Um, Carol, there is a woman on my Upashi course. Her child sadly passed away from battens, but she's passed a law in her country in Serbia that uh, a child who's ill and doesn't have a diagnosis within six months, they need to get three other diagnoses from other doctors. So, you know, it's just amazing what people can do when, when they're passionate about something. So um, I'm just going to leave you with a quote. Do you have a clicker? This is, I think it says it all about public patient involvement. It's a it's a two-way thing, help me help you. That's really encapsulates it for me. I have been, like Mag said, allowed to do things I never imagined that I could do, but I want to give it back now. I've been privileged to get the UPASHI training and I want to now return on the investment. So um, thanks so much for listening to me today and um, it's a great bunch. Thank you.